Right, well, hello everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Julie Kelly and I'm head of the Student Centre. Um, and I've been grappling with CMA-related issues probably for the last two years now, which is uh, quite unbelievable, because um, we, we knew things were coming and then the sort of CMA got involved. Anyway, the idea of today is to give you an overview about what um, uh, the CMA is uh, doing, the guidance that uh, we've been given, and really just what does it mean for the university and what impact is it going to have on um, students. So. Um, the title of the presentation today was Are uh, Students uh, Consumers? And the answer is yes, um, if you hadn't already guessed. And um, one of the interesting things about that sort of question, when I came here for interview three years ago, one of the things I got asked was, asked you, do you think a student is a customer? Um, and interestingly, my answer, I think, at interview was, um, uh, in the hindsight now of, of knowing CMA guidance, I think I got it half right, um, and uh, because I think at the time I said uh, when a, with a student actually they're a customer for like the transactional stuff, so for like accommodation things like that, you know you'd expect to be served on time and politely and, and all that. But actually for the sort of academic side, I, I said I don't think they are a customer; uh, they're more of a partner. Um, and interesting, I think the CMA probably uh, has a different view. So anyway, I'll talk you a bit through, through, through that. Um, okay, I thought this was an interesting slide. What the CMA is all about, and actually the CMA, so it's Competition and Markets Authority, used to be known as the Office of Fair Trading. Okay, so I'll give you an idea about who they are. Um, and what they're trying to do is redress the balance between the students, the poor little skinny folk there, um, and Goliath, us chubby uh, universities, um, because there is a real mismatch um, between the, the rights uh, and the power between students and universities. And what they're trying to do is, is address that balance. So, what's changed? Quite a lot, actually. So I'm going to take you through sort of like the sort of nuts and bolts. Um, I should actually say that I'm happy to take questions as we go along. Obviously, there's plenty of time at the end for questions. So if there's anything really burning, then, then do ask me, and um, I'll, uh, I'll do my best to answer it. OK. So, um, so I'll take you through the changes in a minute, but yeah, so why do students need um, protection? Basically, students are in a really weak consumer position. Um, and for the students, they're, they're, it's a one-off decision. To come to university um, is something you decide probably uh, age sort of 17, 18. Um, and the, one of the other things that um, the CMA has been very clear on is this is like a I say it's once in a lifetime um, decision but also once you're on that road it's really difficult to change so actually once you're here at university it's really hard then to say do you know what I'm not happy with the service I'm getting I'm just going to switch so you imagine sort of like I don't know when you like change bank accounts or I don't know change gym membership or whatever it's really quite easy to switch but actually universities it'd be incredibly difficult to say yeah I'm not happy I'm going to move so then there's, that places a lot more emphasis on the student to make the right decision about this big investment they're making. Um, so, yeah, so students in a really weak consumer position. And then on the other side of the coin, universities are, have got a lot of power, but also they're also um, they're coming under increasing commercial pressures. So we, we need students, we, and we're in a competitive uh, market now, aren't we? We've got to, you know, vie for every student, and so there might be temp there might be a temptation by some universities to oversell the features of, of what they can offer. You know, come to the University of Hertfordshire and get first. You know, come to University of Hertfordshire, um, our London campus. You know, or our, you know, London's only 15 minutes away or 20 minutes away or whatever. And actually, we've got and come and be uh, taught by Brian Cox and you know all these sort of things. So. The, the CMA is really trying to sort of hone those sort of oh, potential for overselling um, right down. Okay, so what do the Competition Markets Authority have to say about it? Um, so yeah, so this is Nisha Ora, Senior Director of the CMA, um, yeah, saying about yes, yeah, crucial one-off decision. Um, leading to a significant investment of time and money. So you think, yeah, students, yeah, so it's three years of their life, but if you think about how much debt a student's going to come out with at the end of that now, I think £9,000 times three, times, if you think about the amount of money cost to, to actually be at university um, each year, it's a huge amount of, um, of time and money. Um, and what, yeah, so the CMA is also saying that actually, yes, yeah, so consumer law now plays a very big part um, of the relationship between universities and students. Okay, so why is it important that we, uh, we take action? It's the law, okay, simple as that. So the CMA were only reacting to changes in law that happened, uh, that uh, came into place in 2014. 
Um, so the CMA is, has got powers to investigate and to prosecute us, so that's quite an important thing to note. Um, and so non-compliance, we could, obviously there's a whole reputational damage that might happen, but the cost of redress could be quite high. So again, think about the 9,000 tuition fees, the living costs, um, what about um, loss of earnings? So actually you could be talking potentially sort of 50,000 pounds per student um, that you know, we might be, uh, might be at risk here. And actually, if you've got one student who's sort of claiming unfair treatment, you're very likely to have others waiting in the wings right behind them. Okay, so it's pretty important that we, uh, that we take notice. So what's it all about? So what the CMA has, has basically introduced is a set of minimum standards um, and in three main areas. So it's all about the information that we provide, our, the fairness of our terms and conditions and the fact that we have good complaint handling processes. And it's the sort of things, if you've bought a washing machine recently or you've bought insurance recently, they're sort of standard things that you would expect as a consumer to have the protection of. And it's really just the university sector now getting up to speed and sort of falling in line with other providers of products and services. Okay, so let's take it step by step. So information provision. So the CMA says that we need to have clear, accurate, and timely information, um, and so it's, it's all about it's okay. It's all about um, the, the applicant being able to make an informed choice about that huge investment and time of money, and so we need to be really clear about what we're offering, um, and there's obviously a number of sort of touch points, open days. Um, and all the printed material and the stuff on the web. And it's really interesting, it's not just what we say on, in writing, it's also what we say verbally. So somebody, an open day, so say if Quentin was stood in our, an open day saying, yeah, come to University of Hertfordshire, we've got bursaries for you. Or, and someone came here and they relied on that information thinking that was a bursary scheme, um, then we could be held liable for that. Basically, we've got to deliver what we say. So we have to provide that information and then we have to deliver it. Okay, so it's quite, hopefully you can see this list. So um, the CMA was very prescriptive um, about the information that we needed to provide. Um, and um, just to give you an idea, the, the ones in bold I think are the real grenades um, uh, on the list there. So composition of course, teaching methods and who's likely to teach you. So what the, the sort of thing they're looking at there, it's not, it doesn't have to, they, you don't have to name the person that's actually going to be, be teaching students, but actually it's that level of, of, of teacher. So um, actually if we sort of saying that we're going to have um, highly respected academics teaching you, then we actually have to provide them. It would be then no good having a postgraduate student, you know, teaching the class. Um, so what else is on there? So method of assessment. This is a really interesting one. Um, so my daughter absolutely hates exams. Okay. So if we would, and we're going to be shopping around for universities um, in the next year or so. So if we found a course that she really liked and it was all about continuous assessment, then she would love that, and we would probably choose that university over others that had exams. So at the point she arrives, and then they say, "Great." sit yourself down, off we go for an exam, she'd say, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, we chose this university on the strength that we weren't going to be having an exam. So it's that type of thing that we need to clearly articulate in advance so students can decide whether it's that, that's for them or not, and then we ha that's what we have to deliver. And I think that's, that's really the sort of essence of what the CMA is about. Um, location of study is another interesting one. So this is to get around people saying that, they, that it's a London campus, and actually it's not. Yeah, you're half an hour outside London, or you're not really in London at all. And Or, or the other thing is where um, students in the past have been potentially uh, sort of moved around. So, um, uh, and it might, not, it might not just be in London, it might be sort of, I don't know, um, it says it's a Leeds campus, but actually you're taught in Bradford, and that's a miles away, and you need, you need public transport to get you there, and you can't get there. And so, again, it's about protecting a, um, students as consumers. Uh, what else? So, yeah, surprising terms. What does that mean? So, basically, we have to highlight to students now anything that they might find surprising. And, of course, that as a sector, that's, we've, we found that quite difficult. Um, 
as what does that mean? And so it could be things like um, our liability dates, so when they, people have to pay their fees. Uh, it could be that there's a, um, uh, so for example, if you're studying uh, an MEng, you've got to be studying, you've got to get a, a grade point average to stay on that MEng. So it's those type of things, and we have to specifically highlight those um, surprising terms to students. And it's no good sort of saying, OK, well, that information is buried somewhere within our policies and our documentation. If it's something that's that important, it needs to be specifically highlighted in advance, um, and students need to be made aware of it. The other main thing the CMA has been particularly interested in, and this is one of the things that the sector has found most difficult, and that's the additional costs. So. Um, university has been quite good at sort of publicising the 9,000 fee. You know, that's quite a well-known um, sort of uh, entity. Um, but what, what uh, universities haven't been very good at in the past, and we'll say this is one of the things that we're really we're running to catch up on, and that is those additional costs that students have to pay. So if you have, uh, in year one, say you have a trip to Europe, it's going to cost £500. You'd need to say that up front. Um, or there's books that people need to buy, or their, you know, uh, uh, material, art materials, or, or whatever it happens to be. If it's actually an essential part of going through that academic program, and you couldn't, unless you pay that money, you couldn't then get your degree at the end of it. You're going to need to clearly articulate that um, to applicants um, while they're still choosing and browsing the course, um, and then you know, so it needs to, and then it needs to bear some reality when the student then gets here. So if we if we said in advance, um, I don't know, they say this European trip's going to cost a thousand pounds, that's roughly what it needs to, to be. If it then turns out to be two thousand pounds, obviously there's a mis potentially a mis-selling claim there. So one of the say the key things we've been now looking to do is trying to capture some of these additional costs, and that's not been easy. Then maybe the information's been there, and students have been told about it maybe when they arrive, but we've not been say as a sector very good at then sort of signposting that information beforehand. Okay, so information. So it's all <coughs> say if you think back to sort of examples of when you've bought things uh, as a consumer, you would expect to have information well before you while you're sort of browsing. Um, and then that information needs to sort of stay the same until you actually get receipt of the service or the product. And it's no different from education. So basically, we need, at the time that um, students are sort of like browsing and applying, um, the information needs to be there on our website. Um, we then need to provide um, similar levels of information, um, so that big long um, shopping list in the offer. And then that information then needs to be consistent at the point they accept their offer and then when they register and enrol with us. So that needs to be sort of seamless all the way through. Um, one of the big pinch points that we sort of found as we were going through doing a sort of a gap analysis on, on whether we were CMA compliant or not was actually we as a university didn't send that information out at offer point. So all we did when we um, actually gave somebody an offer, we just updated um, uh, UCAS and that told them uh, the conditions and what have you. But at no point did we actually send out a whole raft of information saying about the assessment um, and the other cost and, and, and all this sort of thing. So that's been like, the major focus of our work, trying to get that um, uh, sorted out. Um, but yeah, so there's a whole say, cycle of information that we need to provide. Okay, so I mentioned about sort of, yeah, so this information needs to be seamless all the way through that journey. And clearly things might change. Um, and actually the CMA does recognise that things will change, um, but it just, it's asking us then to be considerate about the needs of, sh of students and applicants. Um, and we, if we basically, we need to deliver what we've promised. And if we can't deliver what we've promised, then we need to be able to clearly tell people in good time that things have changed. Um, and to sort of help us with that, we're updating our terms and conditions to actually explain when things might change. And it might be because things change because of professional body requirements. And that's fine. And that's acceptable. Um, but we need to, it's all about the sort of dialogue we then have with our applicants and our students. And, and actually, importantly, we need to let people walk away. Because if they don't then agree with something that's fundamentally changed about their course, then we need to let them be able to, to walk away without fee liability, potentially. Um, so one of the other challenges it's given us is actually we're going to need to lock down certain bits of information earlier so that actually we're able to then give all that information all the way through um, because we have that information, it's, it's been agreed, it's been confirmed and, and we can then tell students about it. 
Interestingly, it might also have the reverse impact that there are certain things we can't tell people about, and that's actually okay too. But then we need to clearly say that we don't have that information, and then the information will be available at a certain point. Okay, so that's okay, and we so we've got legal advice um, about that. But um, at the end of the day, the student does need to get that information before they make an in, uh, the, that informed decision with us. Um, one of the things we might also have to do, so if something changes, we might have to actually continue to teach the student on what they'd originally been promised. Okay. So what does that mean? Because, what? Yeah. for example, in history, mm. there's the, the, very much an emphasis on research-informed teaching. That yeah. means that the modules are decided on who is available to teach, yeah. on research week, for example. Yeah. Uh, so the modules, especially at level six, will change from year to year. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So the sort of uh, the question is um, about yeah you know, when when things change and if, yeah if the modules change from um, from because actually the other thing is uh, so somebody. 2014 is looking at the website they don't eventually even arrive here till 2016 17 and I, I agree things will change and actually we want them to change don't we and, and the CMA does recognize that that um, especially if you think about computer science you would expect you wouldn't expect the old teaching methods you expect things to be up to date uh, so there is something uh, that it does it does allow for that I think what we need to be really careful of is if we're saying as mandatory uh, uh, sort of core modules on a course if we're saying uh, clearly advertising certain sort of specialisms as being something that is available if we then can't deliver them we we do have a problem because if that, that that's what's and that because actually well there was a I mean, and Judy will know there was a complaint last year where actually a student had come to us purely on the basis of a specific module being taught um, and chose us over other institutions because it was very clearly signposted that it was um, it was a human biology aspect to a course and then we changed the course and it, there was no human biology in it and so that was mis, that was mis-selling um, so I think we just need to be careful and obviously we, I'm coming to talk to humanities about um, uh, the sort of impact on, on your school in particular um, but I say if, if we if we specifically say something's available then if we can't then deliver it we're then going to have to go back to the students and say we now can't deliver this and your, the course is actually now something different but uh, I suppose go back to the um, sort of gym example or the car example it's about I suppose how material that change is so so for example um, at the gym uh, you chose that gym because there's a swimming pool and there's exercise equipment okay so if the swimming pool wasn't there or if you chose it because the swimming pool was there you would think no that that's a major change and I, I wanted to swim so that's a big deal actually if you've got various bits of uh, equipment in the gym if they change one piece of equipment for another a new higher tech version you'd probably still be happy with it so what I mean so I think there's there's something about changing the very essence about what you're providing or actually keeping with the same sort of theme about what you're providing just in a different format a more up-to-date format so I think but it's not for us it's not necessarily a case of more up-to-date but it's yeah the, the program learning outcomes within change yeah the topics address but I don't think that's any different in humanities to anywhere else on the curriculum I think and I think the CMA does provide for that um, and I mean I would say uh, to anyone actually is that, that is very interested in, in this the, the 60 page guidance um, that the, the CMA issued is actually quite an easy read and, and it does cover the, that very item so it was worth a read okay yeah sorry go on Shan I think, um, do you want to come in <laughs> it, depends, it depends why you're doing the change as well. Mm. I think if you're doing the change because you think it's a, a better experience, a better education for the students, and you can mm. justify that, then if we're talking about the law, if this ever came before a judge, they'd say mm. that's reasonable, mm. that your, your new curriculum is actually preparing people, people better for work. If you make that change because um, a particular person left, rather than because it's for curriculum reasons, I'd say that the law might say that's not reasonable yes, and indeed. that you should cover that, that there should be a process mm. for covering that. So the example that Julie gave is a real one in that University of Manchester say to their first year students, you will be taught by Brian Cox. Mm. Now they have to be taught by Brian Cox. Yeah. <laughs> you can't then say, oh, well, you know, it's marketing uh, information. Obviously, mm. it'd be different in the kind of under a bus syndrome, the, the judge would say, well, obviously you couldn't see that. If he gets a better offer to go somewhere else, 
then they've got to do something about that by team teaching or doing something else. You've got to build something into the process. Yeah, no, I can I understand that kind of example, but the example that we have is that there are specific modules offered by people with specific research mm. activities, yes. and if they're not available to teachers, you can't just hire in someone mm. to teach that module. No, no, and at what point have you made that, teaching. absolutely, at what point have you made that information available? So is right. it built into the point where students make their choice of modules so that it says? That. You can, but we have to be absolutely explicit about it. So we mm. have to say, and we will then tell you on mm. or around uh, whether that module is going to be available. So don't find that out on the first day back a term, that actually their timetable was nothing like what they chose. Um, but at the point they're choosing their modules, if it's around capacity, for example, mm. so you've only got labs that take 20, so the first 20 students are going to get in, that needs to be mm. in the module choice information. If it's about a specific, you need a certain number to make it viable, so you need more than six, seven, eight, whatever it is, it needs to be in the information. All of it now has, needs to be out front and can't be hidden mm. uh, in terms of decisions that the university has taken, because that may impact on the student making that choice. Um, and so they have to have mm. the opportunity, as Julie said, to walk away yeah. and to say, I can get that module somewhere else. And for example, periodic review then, should we be advertising on the web that a particular subject is going through periodic Yes, review? yeah, and absolutely. If you look at, yeah. the time that the and that's happening now, and it may come up later, but if you look at something like criminal justice, which mm. is going through validation, the website looks considerably different for applicants this year, and it says explicitly that it's going through validation, explains what that means, and says when we will tell them the outcome of that, where before it would have been this website is subject to change. Uh, likewise, in mm. prospectuses, it used to say it's very bland statements like that. You can't do that anymore. You have to be much more explicit and be um, post signposting when you're going to make that information available to people. And is that the responsibility of the school, for example, with periodic review? It will it will come through um, academic services as well. So academic services has got the word in, and they ensure that the website mm. and other places will be saying it. And they'll also be giving advice on how we're going to inform the students and what we should be doing about that. Yeah, so I think it would be fair to say, um, and I'll come to this a little bit later, that they're, um, all of those sort of new processes are being rolled out, um, and uh, I might be a little bit of a chicken, but I've left humanities till last. Sorry, but we are. <laughs> but but, in, but so actually, we can learn important lessons from other schools, and then hopefully we'll be in a really good position to help you. Um, okay, so. Um, so thinking then about um, uh, terms and conditions, so, so this is a, uh, to try and redress the, uh, the David and Goliath um, situation. So uh, terms and conditions need to be fair, clear and easy to find. Um, and pre-CMA, our terms and conditions were hidden in StudyNet. Now they've been pulled out and are um, on the external website. Um, so that they are easy to find. They're actually called key facts, um, which again is a sort of more of an industry term. So if you've ever bought insurance recently, that's the sort of uh, terminology that, that they use. Um, and uh, that's been vetted through legal. Um, and it will it helps us with our sort of obligations about um, fairness, but also it more clearly signposts what we'll do if things change. Um, so yeah, so we do need to make uh, any surprising terms, as, as uh, Sharon was mentioned there, um, specifically uh, highlighted. And actually, that the sort of the subject of validation uh, or periodic review that will be sent to the student as part of their package when they go to when they have an offer. So it'll be very clearly um, articulated to them. Uh, it's worth noting, obviously, so the CMA used to be the Office of Fair Trading, and this is all about fairness. And so actually, if our terms and conditions are considered to be unfair, we won't be able to enforce them. Um, and uh, yeah, so also um, when some applicants apply to us, um, what well, part of the sort of uh, the legislation was about a 14 day, day cancellation, right? I mean, actually, it's a bit of a mute point because actually students have the ability to walk away at quite a number of uh, points, because even the people that come through clearing, they still, even though we've given them an offer, they don't actually have to turn up. We wouldn't enforce the contract, so you have to be here. So it's a bit of a moot point, but it, that's part of the, uh, the legislation. OK, so complaint handling. Um, again, it's all about being accessible, clear, fair. Um, our complaints handling um, uh, uh, information previously was um, quite nicely hidden um, in StudyNet. Um, now it's much more accessible on the external web page um, because we need to be able to have a clear policy not only for students but for applicants as well. 
Um, and it's not good enough just to have those policies and procedures in place. We also have to be seen to be training our staff and, and following them. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's a sort of pa a package of measures. Um, and so it needs to be clear uh, with reasonable timescales um, and allow for appeal and escalation, um, which is all there in our policy. It's just we've never highlighted it I suppose um, in the way that maybe a CMA would expect and, and actually going back to the sort of uh, you know when you buy insurance or any those sort of, any, any brochure that you pick up these days will have it, this is our complaints policy and you can find it on this link so it's quite a sort of an industry standard thing. Okay, so what's the CMA been doing? So March last year, they issued their guidance. Um, they gave us until they gave the sector until October um, last year to get our house in order. Um, it's hard to say actually whether universities are, are quite there yet. Probably not. Um, but they've always they've done two things. They've published a 60-second guide for students and for universities. And actually, I've left a copy um, on the table there. So I would uh, recommend if you haven't seen them to take a copy. They're very so it's on one page, uh, nice, uh, easy to understand. Um, but they've also uh, publicised this complete picture campaign, which was quite interesting. Um, so really just yeah, have uh, that whole thing about choice and you know, have you got all the information. It was quite a nice uh, visual um, cues for students. Um, and actually, that went out. I don't know how, how far it reached, but obviously the, the information is out there for students to, uh, to pick up on. In a way, I'm probably less worried about the CMA. I'm probably more worried about which, because they seem a bit more mavericks. And um, so obviously, the cons they are a consumer uh, organisation. They were very interested um, in how um, the university sector was reacting to the guidance. Um, they've published a number of articles naming and shaming universities. Um, the late their latest was they had a little look at psychology. And they looked at 50 universities' web pages on psychology and basically went through that checklist that we had earlier on the slides and just sort of said, Okay, do sort of red, amber, and green. Do they meet it? And if not, how, you know, how bad are they away from what the CMA uh, garden said? Um, fair to say that not one university came out with a complete green sheet. Um, and the main area that we fell down, thankfully we weren't part of it, um, but the main area that where people fell down was on those other costs that I mentioned earlier. People just don't are just not signposting to that information. But what they're going to do next? Who knows, but uh, they've gone very quiet at the moment, and that might be because actually they can see the sector's addressing it and it's all things are all going well, or it might be they're just waiting to throw the next uh, round of gren grenades at us. Who knows? Okay, so that's the CMA and what they've been up to. So, what have we been up to? Um, so, Sharon is academic. Oh, sorry, Judy, go on. Sorry, say that again. Yeah, so if, if, yeah, so basically if, uh, so it's an interesting point actually, so what does this, yeah, so who does the CMA guidance cover, okay? So the CMA gov guidance actually covers undergraduate students, okay? Um, and it's interesting because us as a university, um, we decided that we would try and apply the CMA principles to all of our students, okay? But obviously, time is a factor and we need to be compliant because obviously the CMA and which and whatever are looking at us. So our main focus is to make sure we get undergraduate provision um, compliant first and then we've got a timetable for sort of rolling that out. Um, and actually, um, so yeah, so I would say if they're an undergraduate, they are an undergraduate yeah. student and they have a contractual relationship with us, then yes, they would, yeah, they would fall, fall under it, under the umbrella. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah I was going to say, I thought so. Nigel Thomas, obviously, quite yeah. um, But uh, in terms of, again, who does mm. it cover, if you've got an international student who always remains international, it doesn't cover them, because it's not a law that goes across boundaries. But mm. as soon as they come to the UK, it then covers them. So we could, you could probably push it and say that the applicant cycle doesn't apply to them, because they're mm. applying abroad. Uh, but when they arrive, we certainly need to deliver to them what we promise. So yeah. the study needs agreements and stuff like that, we need to, and the modules that we're offering, mm. um, it will have an implication for that, there, there's no doubt. I mean, the question around all of this in the end is how litigious will students be mm. and who will be taking up their cases. And that's why I think we're concerned about which particularly, because which are using this as a campaigning mm. thing for them. They, they're getting a new demographic. They're starting to get 16, 17 year olds interested in the magazine and in which itself which they haven't had before, so they're really mm. seeing this as a new niche market for them. Uh, we don't really know where that's going to go. Mm. Yeah. 
so interesting times ahead. But yeah, so to try and obviously, because it's, it's quite a big topic, so what we've tried to do is uh, sort of uh, prioritise it. Alan? It, it was just whether you wanted me to say now about the postgraduate, because that was one of the questions that I wanted to know about whether... Yeah, so, yeah, so our postgraduates covered. So um, the actual, the CMA guidance does not cover postgraduate students and it was really interesting because I pushed back on that and said I don't understand what's the difference between an 18 year old undergraduate and potentially a 21 year old postgraduate or younger actually if they've come from overseas um, and, um, and they really fudged it. Um, uh, and I don't, I, so which is one of the reasons I recommended to, to CEG when we took it there that actually we shouldn't differentiate um, because well, it would be too flipping difficult to administer if, if nothing else. And actually we should just be seen to be fair and reasonable and compliant for all of our students. Um, it's just say so because of this sort of like a, this sort of time pressure, we've starting with undergraduates, but we will roll out, say like the, the offer um, uh, things to everybody. Uh, it's just yeah, it's a matter of timing. Um, but actually, interesting. So although the CMA guidance only covered undergraduates, the unfair contracts stuff that underpins what they, their guidance is on covers everything. So they don't just that that the law doesn't distinguish between an undergraduate and a postgraduate. So I think their guidance is fundamentally flawed on that basis. Um, but their argument is actually that it's that 17, 18 year old that is a very vulnerable and say in a very poor consumer position. Once you become a postgraduate, you're potentially doing it for business reasons, like for work, qualification, you know. Um, and actually then in almost you don't need the protection. I think I think that argument's flawed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so so what we did um, when we got the guidance. We did a gap analysis to sort of say, okay, how are we, how as a university are we falling short of what the guidance said? Um, and actually then we sort of uh, split the work, if you like, into five um, very different strands um, that I've outlined there. And then um, Sharon basically keeps us all in order um, as academic registrar. So yeah, we try. She tries to keep me in order. Okay, so... Um, one of the key things was about our terms and conditions. Um, and as I mentioned, we've now got this document called Key Facts, um, which you can find on, the, on a new web, uh, web page there, uh, www.hearts.acuk forward slash apply, forward slash becoming a student. And actually that page then actually sort of explains, um, doesn't really say about what the CMA is, but it explains about the fact that, it, yeah, going to university is a big decision. And actually there's rights and responsibilities both sides. Here's our, our um, terms and conditions, have a look. Um, and it also explains the sort of the documentation that they'll be sent. So when they get an offer from the University of Hertfordshire, they'll also get a suite of documents that explains about it um, and gives them all the information they need to make an informed choice. Um, on that page is also now for the first time uh, publicly available a fees policy, which again we always had buried very deeply um, in study now and in the sort of in the back of um, uh, very deep uh, back in the uh, back office. Um, and now, of course, we can't do that. We need to be very clear about what, what fees we're charging, um, and so that is nice and clear uh, out there. Um, and say so, so. And the other uh, thing that's on there under that sort of strand is. Um, this, so this new offer documentation that I mentioned um, earlier that we need to be sending out. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Um, so yeah, so soon, basically what will happen, and we've only, we only just started to send the first um, uh, lot of offers in January. Um, so obviously we've still been offering places to people, we just haven't been sending the documentation. So we've just got now a, a system built where we can, as soon as somebody goes um, unconditional firm with us, then or conditional firm, they will be sent a, an email with lots of attachments on that explains all that information, those minimum requirements um, to them. Okay, so that's terms and conditions. Then there's a, a, like a marketing angle to this, as you can imagine. Um, so uh, what we needed to do was need to make sure that all our open day presentations were vetted for CMA compliance um, and actually that the information was stored centrally. So that actually if someone came back and complained uh, in six months' time to say, at an open day, you said this to me, we could then go back, find that presentation and say, yeah, did we say that or didn't we? Um, and one of the things actually the, the complaint I mentioned earlier sort of highlighted that actually our record keeping wasn't that good. Um, and we weren't able to check back to a certain date on the website and we didn't have information available from previous open days. And so now we're having, um, we're taking like a snapshot of the website um, uh, I'm not, I want to say daily, but weekly. Yeah, so we're taking a snapshot of the website weekly so we can actually see um, w what we said at a certain period of time. So if there were any, was any discrepancy about what information the student thinks they had between what, what we think they had, we can, we can double check. 
Clearly there's also a need for us to train all the staff that present at open days. Um, so they all um, were given guidance on the sort of the do's and don'ts. And so it's all about obviously just clearly not overselling um, what, we, what we can offer. All the marketing publications are being vetted. Um, and one of the other things that we're doing is making sure that the, the actual course content on, on the website is correct. And that's actually a bit of a work in progress. Alan. Um, OK, one of my questions is about whether it just has to be proved in written form or whether verbal promises can also be... Oh, verbal com promises are most definitely covered by the guidance. OK, because one of my issues is particularly with placements. I'm, yep. I'm sure everybody will grow because that's what I always talk about. Um, is I suppose what I'm worried about is, uh, and this is no criticism of any staff because I've been yeah. a vicious chief myself before previously, is if you, uh, for example, promised a student that mm. they would have, say, a placement in theatres yeah. uh, for the nursing students in social work, that they would have a statutory placement and that we yeah. could then provide that. If that wasn't on a presentation and one of the admissions mm. tutors promised that the student would have that experience and then we couldn't offer it in the end for a variety of reasons. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, that we don't have control over all of our placements all of the time. So I suppose my question is, is where would we stand in? Yeah, so the question is, um, yeah, so if we made verbal promises about placements, would we have to uh, hold to them? I think you've got to be super careful what you promise. Um, and I would say that you need to, you, you would need to train your staff not to say, <laughs> not to promise, because if you can't, if you can't guarantee it, you, then you shouldn't say it. Um, and you maybe ought to sort of uh, caveat it with, you know, with these are the types of placements we've been able to arrange in the past. That would be a better, uh, better sell. Can oh, I, sorry. yeah, go for it. Can I, can I just broaden that a little bit to sure. what information we do know and what we don't know yeah. at, at the point where people are... That would be key for people to make a decision. I think yeah. it's specifically about the timetable. Yeah. Um, so for students who have childcare or care of vulnerable mm. adults' responsibilities, yeah. to find that they may be taught between five and seven then becomes impossible for them. Yeah. But I can't tell them exactly what their, their mm. first year timetable might look like at the point that they have to make a decision to accept it. Yeah. I suppose the interesting thing about that is we don't publish our timetable in advance. Mm. So we can't be held to it because it's not out well, in the that, public that's domain. That's exactly but I suppose if somebody came to you and said, when will my teaching hours be, yes. then, you're in a, then you're in a tricky situation. Because, and it might be, you have to say, I'm really sorry, but I can't tell you. Mm because it hasn't been decided yet, but you will know by such and such date. And then they've, they're in that informed choice. They, they can either go ahead on the basis, mm. it might clash, and they, they'll have to sort it out, or they'll, they'll and then have to decide, well, actually, I, I can't afford to do that, because it, you know, if I can't get childcare, I can't do it. And, but then it's their decision to decide to come or not. I suppose I'm wondering in my mind whether it's deemed fair and reasonable to say to somebody, you may be taught any time between eight and Again, it goes back to sort of Sharon's point about, um, you know, what would a judge think sitting in yes. front of them? And I think um, I'd be more worried if we specified on the website what the teaching hours were and then yeah. we couldn't deliver them. If someone then specifically asks, then you're going to have to be very guarded about what you say. Uh, I think it is. I mean, we do, uh, we do teach from quite early till quite late now, don't we? So the teaching day is very long. And so I don't think it is unreasonable to expect to have tuition within that period. But as I say, if someone had childcare, unless, we, unless they've specifically asked, because we don't make any promises, do we, about when someone's going to be taught or which days they're going to be taught. Um, so. And I, think those, I think it's not reasonable to say that we should say that, because it's often three years at least uh, if we're talking about undergraduates. Mm. So you can't be saying what somebody's going to be doing years so I think it's not unreasonable to say you, you won't you can't get that detail information it's possible you could be taught um, a bit more in, or um, later in the evening but generally teaching is in this period I think that's fair it's when you it's, if you write if someone asks you you said oh no that definitely wouldn't happen it's overselling we yeah right there's a couple of questions up the back there go on sorry can I just come on from that because God, <laughs> no, we'll come back to you it's the point that I mean I, I've as I'm a, as a mission tutor so I'm always very careful not to make promises always have been yeah. but in amongst that discussion about mm. um, when the, the, the modules may or may not run, mm. I might say, well, last year mm. the modules ran this way. There is no guarantee it will be yeah. the same, but it's quite possible. Yeah, and I think there's. Sort of yeah, and I. Might yeah. Surprising. Surprising. I mean, I'm just wondering if it could be surprising in terms of. 
highlight yeah. I think if you if you knew in advance that teaching was only on a Friday, teaching was only going to be in the evening, I think that would be surprising to somebody. Yeah. So I think that that that's when you need if it's actually just normally just timetabled and scheduled across the, the, the teaching day, I don't think you need to say anything. But if you say if something was odd like that, I think you would want to highlight that. Right, question at the back. So just continuing on the timetable <coughs> situation. So if we have students in over at Sports Village for um, discussing school and, and how they can represent the university on the afternoon, mm -hmm. can we not promise that they then can represent their their um, institution because we can't promise that they won't be lectures on a Wednesday afternoon because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. at the moment other universities obviously promote the fact that you know Wednesday afternoons are kept free for students taking part in sport yeah but we've seen people quite consistently this year that's not not the case with the timetabling issues yeah I mean I don't obviously I can't really comment about timetabling English issues and I think I'd just go back to the fact that if you can't guarantee it then you shouldn't say it so I don't know there's anything else you want to say to that no, my, my answer generally it will be generally that um, generally uh, we would expect undergraduates to be free on a Wednesday afternoon and I think that we are trying to, um, that came up for example at CEG just last week through the utilisation survey and certainly at the highest level, at Quinton level, we absolutely want it to be that Friday after, uh, Wednesday afternoons is kept free for, uh, mm -hmm. for sport for undergraduates particularly. Um, I've only recently just graduated in my first year I was looking forward to signing up to class and I had lectures scheduled throughout my first year on a Wednesday afternoon yeah. And although it wasn't sort of the be or leisure sure. for me, um, it was also frustrating okay. for someone who may well have come to the school. No, we yeah. understand. And I think that if that student came forward, they then we should look at that favourably. I mean, that's my personal opinion. Um, but, uh, but I think in terms of the context of CMA, I think people are hearing, and we need to get that message to admissions tutors and others that are presenting uh, outreach activities, that we shouldn't be saying, you absolutely can. Uh, represents the university on Wednesday afternoon because other constraints will come in. But it is generally mm. a principle of the university that undergraduates are free on a Wednesday afternoon. I think it would be mm. okay to say that. Yeah, but I suppose the other thing is if we are doing a massive, big splash advertising campaign saying, "Come on, you know, you can do this on a Wednesday afternoon," and then we don't <laughs> deliver it, then obviously then we're in a whole world of pain. <laughs> I think there was another question, Stephen. Hi. Um, yeah, I just had a question around. Um, you're saying about the university's safeguarding itself. Of the website, so yeah. It's all of it, uh, actually. Yeah. So the whole the whole website is uh, is going through a process of being scraped. Sounds quite unpleasant. Um, but basically, the whole the whole of the, the whole website is being. Um, uh, well, I think they basically take out the sort of heavy uh, sort of images and that sort of thing that's taken up the memory. But then they'll they'll take all of the factual information and then it'll get stored um, weekly so that we can go back and check the late the nearest date to when the complaint. Good question. I mean, we can. I can take that back and actually uh, just double check. I suppose it depends on yeah what the, the claim is, isn't it? But um, yeah, yeah, interesting point. Right. Go. Go. It does, and you, the training material was sent out via Marcoms to all areas that were working in the open day. So if it hasn't filtered down to you, I would uh, talk to your line manager about that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. That's part of this as well. So <coughs> yeah. you, you may be hearing it for the first time. Julie, how many of these have you done? Uh, probably about 10. And I've maybe. probably done about 20. Um, yeah. So we've been going out far and wide to people that we, we kind of targeted at first. Mm. And then, likewise, from this, the end of this, we'd say, if you think this is particularly relevant for your area, let us know and we'll come and do a talk mm. um, in your area. Mm. And we were seeing what the take-up would have been for a general one like today. And if the take-up was large, which it was, we'll repeat it and do one over um, at the Haviland. And we'll just keep going until mm. we hope we've spoken to as many people as possible. But with all these things, people need to engage with it. You can go and talk to them, but people mm. need to um, engage with it. Yeah. And I think it has sort of taken on a bit of a life of its own as well, hasn't it? As people have got more interested and uh, sort of engaged with it. Judy? Yeah, just about the um, training for open days, who's taking on that training? Okay, well, uh, as, yeah, as I mentioned, so uh, marketing communications um, were given, I, I helped write it, um, and it was given to Lucy, Drew, to then 
cascade out. So if you haven't seen it, and so then I would suggest you contact her. Feel that it's. You did, did you say? Yeah. Okay, that's good. So it's obviously patchy then. Yeah. Well, it would be the it'd be the people that. Uh, we'll yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do that. Actually, I'll plow on because I'm almost at the end. So then we'll just open up to sort of general questions. Um, okay, so, so I mentioned earlier some of the things we needed to do was try and button down various pieces of information, and so that has actually had an impact on the, the programme strand of the work that we're doing, um, and Academic Quality are introducing a new uh, slightly slicker timetable for course sign-off. Um, I'm not going to say too much about that because I don't know enough detail to answer any uh, really detailed questions, but if anyone has anything more detail, we'll take that back. Um, but basically, the, the, the other thing they're doing is, so actually then if we have, when the students are on course, if then we are changing things when they're sort of implementing a new process of how that information gets cascaded out. Okay, so I mentioned already about complaints and how, how now it's um, uh, visible from the external website, not just only from StudyNet, um, and the fact that now the complaints policy is accessible to applicants, not just students, um, and that we will be um, training our, our frontline staff to, uh, to, to be able to even if it's just we're seen to have delivered some training uh, from the CMA's point of view. But yeah, so it's good news really to get uh, train, staff more trained on um, how to deal with complaints. And then just briefly, so the things, um, so this is part of the implementation is what we're doing today, UH briefing. We've been, Sharon's saying, been to quite a few presentations now um, uh, in uh, sort of SBU management meetings and the like. Um, so this, uh, so we're filming this today, so this will be part of a training resource that's then going to go on StaffNet. Um, and then, yeah, there will be, there has been specific training for other key staff. So in my team, for example, in admissions, um, and I'm fairly certain it got mentioned at admissions tutor forum. We certainly touched, we got touched on. So key people have had training and say this is part of the sort of more sort of general awareness. Okay, I got there. It's the end. So questions for anyone who's not.